Gray, Business Development Manager and Sector Manager, Energy and Environment at the Ontario Centres of Excellence. Thank you for joining us for this panel presentation and welcome to Discovery. I'd also like to remind you that if you are tweeting today's session, please use the hashtag at OCE Discovery. I'm pleased to welcome you to this panel, Intelligent Cities and Sustainable Infrastructure. The evolving complexity of urban environments along with aging infrastructure and rapid population growth creates challenges and opportunities for cities. In the next hour, this panel will look at cities worldwide and consider how better informed cities can lead to transformative decision making. This in turn should result in cities adopting selected technologies and innovations which give cost effective solutions for infrastructure resulting in smarter, healthier cities. I would like to introduce you to the moderator for this session, Senator Art Eggleton. Art Eggleton has served the people of Canada and the City of Toronto in elected office for over 40 years. Initially, he was a member of Toronto City Council and the Metropolitan Toronto Council, which include 11 years as Toronto's longest serving mayor. He served another 11 years as an MP in the Parliament of Canada, where he held several cabinet positions, including Minister Responsible for Infrastructure, before being appointed to the Senate in 2005. He currently serves as Deputy Chair of the Standing Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology, and is a member of the Standing Committee on Transportation and Communications. He is also Chair of the Global City Indicators Facility operating from the University of Toronto. Welcome, Art. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Anything to get out of Ottawa and all that Senate chaos. Going out, when I come to Toronto, my, my home, and of course, more chaos at City Hall. My old, uh, my goodness, what a week. What a time. Well, in the... Uh, Last session, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Diametis, said that uh, in his book, Abundance, he has a subtitle saying, the better is future than you, the future is better than you think. Okay, well, let's see if we can make that into some reality in this kind of session here. Because we bring together so many things in the aspects of lives in our cities, uh, whether it's transportation, that's a big issue right now in Toronto, particularly with the Metrolinx, uh, announcement today, housing, communications, technical, mechanical, ecological, economic, political, and social uh, matters are all part of that system. And cities are getting bigger all the time. And more and more people are living in urban areas right throughout uh, this world. In fact, 200,000 people on average will be added to the world's urban population each day, each day, between now and uh, 2015. So in this session, we're going to examine cities. We'll examine them in a, a global context. And we will particularly look at the question of infrastructure, the need for informed cities to be informed so that they can make intelligent decisions uh, about infrastructure investment. And infrastructure investment, both in terms of the deficit uh, that presently exists uh, in uh, the aging infrastructure, plus as you add to the population, you need more new infrastructure, and then you've got the, the new technology, which uh, that's where I hope uh, the future is better than we think, because that'll help us to, uh, to uh, look to that new technology to help us out further in terms of finding cost-effective solutions and to be able to make smarter uh, investments for the healthy uh, future of our citizens. Now, I'm also happy to come today as the, the chairman of the Global City Indicators Facility. Our first speaker, Patricia McCarney, from the University of Toronto, will be speaking on that issue because this is, for the first time, bringing together a database uh, from, uh, from cities around the world so that we're able to develop a standardized methodology of global city indicators or metrics. And that kind of information is going to be very valuable for cities to plan their future. And planning the future is really what we've got to get our heads into because we're still operating, and even here in Toronto, on the old planning and development principles of the last uh, century. 
So it's time to, to move uh, that forward. And this database, uh, which we are developing out of the University of Toronto, which started with the World Bank, I might add, and they're all, well, a former uh, official with the World Bank is one of our speakers today. So all of that is playing into uh, the discussion that we have today. Now, let me introduce, um, we'll go by the way, it's an hour long session. We started at 10 after, so we'll go to 10 after unless somebody pulls the hook on me. Uh, we have <coughs> five speakers and uh, I'll introduce them uh, one at a time. Uh, and uh, the first speaker up, actually not up, they're gonna sit right there and they're going to speak from there, but they've only got seven minutes each. Now, I come from a place where we we really pull out the hook after seven minutes. I've been a victim of it myself. So the first person is Professor Patricia McCartney, and she is uh, Director of the Global City Indicators Facility at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, the University of Toronto. She is currently a professor of political science <coughs> and director of the new Global Cities Institute just being launched at the university. <coughs> Everybody's got a glass of water, I'd appreciate it. She's also director uh, of the Global City Indicators Facility, <coughs> which I said earlier was initiated by the World Bank, which is positioned to gather and retain the definitive and authoritative validated self-reported urban data from across the globe. <coughs> GCIF tracks progress on 115 indicators across more than 250 cities worldwide. She's also an author, as I think all of these people are, of several books about cities and global governance and numerous articles and papers also on that subject. Please welcome Professor Patricia McCartney. So, um the monitor in the front is supposed to be working to guide us, but I don't see it on yet, so I'm just... Otherwise, I can go to the podium, I guess. Can we get this monitor on? Well, I'll begin, because you can see it, I think, so why don't I just begin? Um, maybe we'll get to see it as well. <laughs> um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I don't know if you can hear me all right at the back. The sound is a little bit coming at us from the floor, but hopefully just, just let me know if you can't hear very well. Um, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes about um, this initiative called the Global City Indicators Facility. And I begin with, um, uh, by the way, there are some uh, materials on the GCIF uh, here in the room, which we will just put out here on the table at the end if anyone's interested in picking some things up so that I can be even briefer in how I present this. So to start with, um, as uh, Senator Eggleton mentioned, we're going through a tremendous demographic transition, which we're all hearing about in terms of how the world is becoming increasingly urban and how by uh, 2050, 75% of the world will be urbanized. Uh, we're just over that threshold now. Um, around 2007, 2008, we passed the ur rural urban divide. Uh, that threshold was passed. So we're probably about 55, 56% now. Um, in terms of um, another transition, though, that's important to think about and why we have uh, the need for very uh, uh, coherent and um, strong metrics also has to do with the economic transition in the world. So as you can see, 75% of global GDP is being generated by cities. So the need for sound data and the need for strong metrics um, um, has become even more vital. So as um, Senator Eggleton mentioned, this program actually started with the World Bank, and you're going to hear from Dan Hornwig in a few minutes, who was in the urban sector at the bank at the time. Um, starting a pilot program asking cities what indicators do you gather now and um, how many indicators and how much are you spending. Um, so Dan told me this story back in 2008, I think it was, as early as 2008, uh, whereby he brought together uh, the pilot group of cities who we asked this question to and the World Bank convened a meeting, in fact, here in Toronto. It turned out that cities actually gather a lot of data and cities gather a lot of data on almost all the same things, all the usual suspects. How are we doing on health? How are we doing on safety? Uh, water, 
sanitation, transit, et cetera. So there were 1,100 indicators being gathered by all of these cities, and it turned out that only two of those indicators were comparable. There was no standard definition. Uh, people in one city could not talk to another city, so Sao Paulo measured a uh, number of police officers per 100,000, for example, differently than Toronto did. So we were tasks, tasked at the University of Toronto at that time with seed funding from the World Bank to actually even out this methodology, the definitions, retest it with the uh, nine pilot cities and come up with a standardized methodology so that cities can actually talk to each other. So it differs from some of the um, national statistical bureaus around the world who measure cities certain ways. Uh, you probably all know anyone who works on cities that those boundary issues wreak havoc with standardized data. So we have many footnotes whenever we try to compare three or five, let alone 250 cities. There's a lot of footnotes on the exceptions because of the boundary issues, because of the definitions, and because of the methodologies. So we've tried over the last, um, since 2008, 2009, 2010 to standardize it. In 2010, we started to roll it out to cities beyond these initial nine pilots. And we're now, today, oh, it's got a very strong delay, at 250 cities worldwide. Um, the membership of the GCIF is on every continent, and uh, we're set to grow to 1,000 cities. Uh, over the next few years. Cities can group themselves into peer groups, so if you're over a million cities, there's about 70 cities over a million that can now compare themselves to each other and draw comparative lessons and learning. Uh, the, the indicators are a number of 115 indicators uh, spread throughout city services and quality of life. Uh, city services, all the usual, and quality of life. And the list is all posted on our website if you're interested in going further. The standardization has now been successful to the point that we've taken it to the International Standards Organization, uh, where we're moving through a process of ISO certification. And um, it's been about a year and a half in coming. All member countries of the ISO have been commenting. We've gone through probably hundreds of comments over the last few months, um, if not thousands um, over the next few months. We're receiving now more comments because as of today, I'm told at midnight, um, this is going out for global ballot. So the ISO um, balloting process is launched at midnight tonight. It'll be out there for three months with countries commenting back on our standard. And um, we're told it should be fine. Um, we have affirmative votes from almost all of the participating countries and we should have an ISO number attached to these metrics so we become the standard metric uh, for cities globally. Uh, that should close August 27th, so stay tuned. I'm trying to advance it, but there it is. Um, so we're governed by um, a set of um, uh, really important uh, stakeholders and partners and individuals. Uh, we have mayors of cities from around the world, uh, international organizations, and many smart individuals on our international advisory board. And we're just now building something called the International Corporate Advisory Boards. We're taking on um, some very strategic partners. Uh, Lucy Casacha to my left has um, just joined, uh, so Siemens is a member of our new ICAB. Uh, GDF Suez, Philips, and Cisco have been members now for a few months. Uh, Scotiabank has just joined. And we're planning to build this um, partnership uh, with in in industry partners um, internationally over the next year, moving that board up to uh, 12 members. And we have a number of MOUs with many uh, international actors. Um, UNEP, for example, was a partner on a number of sustainable um, cities platforms, and the Inter-American Development Bank has been a partner with us on Latin American cities on sustainable infrastructure. So we've had a number of MOUs, and many of those um, partners, in fact, have become parts of, part of our governing process on the board. I was just going to then finally touch on a few applications of how cities and international agencies and how we in here in Toronto are starting to use this database. It's growing. Uh, with 250 cities reporting on 115 indicators, it's becoming a very robust database over time. Um, so, for example, in Rotterdam, um, 
they have started to use this, um, the GCIF indicators around um, energy use, and they've taken it with a GIS platform down into neighborhoods of Rotterdam to start to see how e energy consumption is being um, used across neighborhoods to better define um, policy and prescriptions for improvements on energy consumption in the city of Rotterdam. Um, for another example is the um, UNICEF approached us a few weeks ago, actually a few months ago, we were meeting with them last week to start to prepare an index on um, a child-friendly city index. Uh, we're testing that right now with a number of pilot cities and that's being developed and should be launched in um, September uh, with Mayor Bloomberg in New York. Another application closer to home is the Ontario Aggregation Pilot. Uh, this pilot is, a, uh, is really a response to the needs of not only Toronto, but Sao Paulo is asking for this, um, Helsinki is asking for this, because we all know that although we have standardized the data to stay within the municipal boundary, so we, we measure according to the administrative boundary of cities so that we do have um, a potential to, I, I see, we do have a potential to um, always have a standard around that data, but we can also now um, have it, we've developed a tool to aggregate the data up to a regional level, which is really the economic functional area of cities. So that's under um, pilot here, we will roll that out globally uh, after November of this year. So finally, in closing, I just want to let you know some of the thematic areas that we're developing um, with the indicators. One is on cities and prosperity, which was just recently launched. Um, in fact, our premier was um, part of that launch um, this past year. Um, diversity, <clears throat> aging in the cities, which is a snapshot being um, partnered with Philips because of their um, technologies and development around aging in place. <clears throat> Sustainable infrastructure, which we're partnering with GDF Suez on authorship of that one. Uh, climate, uh, mobility and transit is the one coming down the pipeline right now. It's in um, close to final draft. Education, uh, governance and finance, land use planning and design, uh, safety, health, uh, and water, which are all topics of interest for, um, I think, this uh, group. So as we move through the data and develop this data set, the prospective power of these indicators is becoming clear for planners, designers, politicians. City mayors are increasingly asking for this kind of data. How are we doing relative to our peers? Uh, this question is coming before city managers worldwide. Um, so as we move through this transition, demographic transition, those kinds of questions, what city forms are we contemplating, what density, what physical reach are we expecting? Uh, we will start a research arm of all of this, which is the Global Cities Institute at the University of Toronto, which is um, official, officially uh, to be launched in September of this year, uh, which will take the data and the GCIF will be the anchor program in the Global Cities Institute, and we will start to move that into research and policy, uh, visualization and um, city management. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Patricia. It's and uh, next, let me welcome uh, Lucy uh, Caccia, who is Vice President. Now, th this is on a business card. Is it Low and Medium Voltage Division? Uh, city she's also City Manager for Siemens for the GTHA, and she's also involved in the 2015 Pan Para Pan Am Games. Uh, and she's, a program she's the Program Manager for that on behalf of Siemens Canada. So as a vice president, she leads over 400 people across uh, the, the country, providing critical power solutions for various customers across industrial, oil, gas, healthcare, cities, and infrastructure. What's left? It's all there, Lucy. Um, she's responsible for all related activities for Siemens in the greater Toronto, Hamilton area in regards to sustainable city solutions. Siemens' unique environmental portfolio has helped major urban centers worldwide reduce their share of CO2 emissions while helping increase productivity and competitiveness. Ms. Cassia brings to Siemens extensive experience in the areas of engineering, construction management, and commissioning of capital expansion projects. Lucy? Great, thank you. 
So I'm really delighted to be here also. And, and a very interesting story is that Siemens had been doing research about cities for about six years before I met the Patricia and uh, her team at the GCIF. And we both found that we were speaking the same language. So much so that uh, Siemens decided to support the, the um, data and the ISO pursuit of the GCIF that we did join the uh, advisory board, as Patricia mentioned. So we had also seen many trends that were also um, highlighted by Patricia. And one important thing that we kept coming to conclude was that with, if cities do nothing different, then the impact on our environment will be very severe. So not only are they generating the 75% of the world's GDP, but they're also creating 80% of the GHG emissions. So we really thought Siemens as a company should step up. And we stepped up because we think and we believe and we know that working with cities who apply technology, they can leverage that technology, those solutions, to increase their competitiveness, to increase their quality of life and also support the protection of the environment. So we undertook a massive restructuring of our company with over 400,000 people around the world and we separated that team so that 80,000 people globally could focus on infrastructure in cities. And we're look, looking at it from two angles. One is that we have solutions that we've helped many companies with achieve, achieving their goals um, over 100 years. But we also know we can apply some of those solutions to cities. And here are some examples that we've been active in. In Canada, we've been here for over 100 years, and in Germany, much longer. But it's important that we look at the city as a holistic entity. And I think Patricia covered many topics in terms of the research areas that they're looking at from the GCIF. And we believe that that data is very critical because in order to leverage technology, you really need to create an evidence-based business model. And many cities, as Patricia mentioned, and to our experience as well, as many cities had the data, but it was in very hard to retrieve locations. And it wasn't easy to sort and it wasn't easy to analyze. So now that we are uh, supporting the GCIF, we think that that can really bring a new level of achievement to cities in terms of competitiveness and their, um, their quality of life and attracting key talent and retaining that key talent. So we work in many areas where you need data to, to make those business cases. And also, I know Carl will speak about funding and funding for infrastructure. People need to know what is the business case if you're going to use technology to leverage your advancement. And we've done uh, many solutions, including traffic management to ease congestion. We've supported renewables for many years. In fact, we have a, a, a wind turbine blade manufacturing plant here in Ontario. So we really see that that's part of community building and also creating that economic competitiveness. So what are cities looking for? They're looking for efficient transportation of people and goods. And here in Toronto, we know that congestion has been quoted by the Toronto Board of Trade to cost $6 billion a year in lost productivity. That's a lot of money that we could really be using to advance our, our cities and grow into a competitive global uh, uh, area. And also energy. We did research in Canada and the top five topics that came up included where will, will a reliable energy supply come from? Will it only be based on water? Will it need to be a combination of renewables, hydro, and nuclear? What is the right mix? That's a question on, on many citizens' minds across the country. And in terms of the health care and quality of life, we don't want to create more pollution as we're growing. And cities are growing, as Art mentioned. So it's very important that as the cities grow that we really plan for that growth so that we don't pollute and contaminate the air that we're trying to, to breathe and for ourselves and for the future generations. And water. Water is a very key topic all across the country. Where will our water source be secured from? Here in Ontario we're very lucky with over 100,000 lakes, but other provinces around Canada don't have that security in terms of water supply. So how will we uh, make that, that supply of water cost effective so that everyone has access to it? 
And lastly, but not least, of course, security and, and uh, quality of life. So if we are going to grow our economies, if we are going to be considered to be competitive and get that key talent from around the world, we need to be able to make the communities very attractive so people will stay there and live there and, and, uh, and keep their next generations. So I mentioned that we took cities so seriously that we reorganized our entire company. So you'll see that we worked in the industry sector, we call it, and, and with that we've been doing for over 100 years here in Canada. Energy, creating clean energy, re supporting renewable energy and all the infrastructure around energy. Healthcare, to support people's livelihoods and, and staying healthy with all of our imaging and, and therapy technologies. And then there's the infrastructure in cities. And as I mentioned earlier, we have 80,000 people now focused on how to make cities better, how to make them more competitive, and use that technology as a lever. So here are some of the solution areas that we focus on, and we think that we have many best practices to support these, not only in North America, but globally. For example, uh, we, when, we, when we focused on cities, we said, how can we really demonstrate our commitment to cities? And we undertook an, a $50 million investment to create a new building, which Senator Eggleton and uh, Pro Professor McCartney have been to. Uh, this is our commitment to walking the talk. So we said that cities are important enough that we need to, sh to walk the talk, create uh, a lighthouse project so people can determine how to do it and what kind of technologies are available today, not just in the future. So that was the rendering that you saw, the previous slide, and now you can see the actual physical building that sits in London. And we have a combined use space, so we have meeting rooms, we have an interpretive center, and in fact, as a guest, when you, when you enter the building and you register, we have an RFID system. We leveraged our own technology so that depending on the, the area that you work in, whether you're an elementary school student or whether you're an architect, the interpretive center content changes, so it matches to the unique individual. So we think that's pretty uh, interesting and that can show people the way of the future. And again, walking the talk. So we implemented the highest number of applicable technologies to really reduce the impact on the environment. And uh, the commitment was there and it also shows in terms of our numbers. So you can see some of the projections and then you can actually see in orange the consumption at the crystal. So I welcome anyone uh, who might be in England to contact us and you can enjoy and, and see the, the building yourself and learn and see how you can apply some of those solutions to your city. And I think that um, we're going on to the next slide. Next presenter, thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Yeah, I'm sorry about the... I know this is kind of a rushed up situation. This clock down here, by the way, if you can, maybe Dan won't see it there. He, he might go a lot longer. But there's a clock down here that tells you uh, when you're up, your seven minutes is up. At any event, uh, we'll now go on to uh, Carl uh, Bodemid, who's Senior Vice President, Strategy and Business Development Canada for Hatch Mott McDonald. He's 30 years of experience in project management and engineering for a wide range of projects in the water supply and wastewater treatment urban infrastructure, and brownfield development, power, and industrial sectors. He's Senior Vice President at Hatch uh, Martin McDonald. He presently serves also as Chair of the Ontario Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. Ontario Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, a group of six professional organizations that are committed to promoting safe and sustainable infrastructure in Ontario. Please welcome Carl. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Senator Eggleton, and uh, very pleased to be here today at uh, this very interesting conference, and also quite optimistic about the future now after having heard the keynote speaker. Um, my opening remarks uh, in the next little while will really be raising some questions. Um, uh, what do we mean by sustainable infrastructure? What are the, where do we need to focus our efforts to achieve that goal? And how can innovation, the, the essence really of this conference, help in that goal? So, uh, likely many of you are familiar with the free-legged stool concept of sustainability. 
and essentially to achieve true sustainability, each one of those legs has to be in place. Uh, so for respect to say an infrastructure system, for example, uh, the infrastructure has to minimize the impact on the environment. It has to provide the service that society requires from it. And lastly, it needs that appropriate uh, economic requirements be in place. And I'm going to talk and particularly focus on that last part, okay, the fiscal sustainability, the financial sustainability. Because unless that leg of the stool is there, obviously the stool falls over, but unless that is in balance with the rest, either the, the infrastructure will start to generate more impacts on the environment, or it will deteriorate the service levels which it's delivering will start to deteriorate over time. Oops. There we go. Okay. So, for any infrastructure system to be financially or fiscally sustainable, there has to be balance. And we can see from the teeter totter here that the cost of providing that service needs to be balanced by the charge the user pays. Obviously, if those aren't in balance, on one side the teeter-totter goes up or down. In the past, the cost of the systems that we have received, the cost of the services that we've received through our infrastructure systems have not been fully covered by the charges to the users. Okay. And this has created an infrastructure deficit. Now, to address that deficit, and to move towards a more sustainable infrastructure systems, we must restore that balance so the teeter-totter is in balance. Now we can do that two ways. We can either increase the charges to the user, not very popular, okay, with uh, the, the payers, the rate payers, and the politicians, etc. cetera, um, or we can lower the cost of providing service, or a combination of both to mitigate the impacts. And to lower the cost of reducing service, there's two ways to do that. We can either lower the level of service so we get less or, or lesser quality service. And uh, in fact, there's some very interesting conversations going on in uh, municipalities uh, all across Australia at the present time as to whether the, the level of service they are presently receiving is in fact fiscally sustainable. Okay. Or we can deliver those services more efficiently. And this, I think, is where innovation and, uh, and uh, new technologies can really assist in that goal and restore that balance. In restoring that balance, I think we have to uh, realize as well that the, the, in, the, in a project, the majority of the cost is not actually during the construction, but in the operations and maintenance. Now this graphic here uh, just illustrate, illustrates um, diagrammatically how the life cycle, uh, how the cost of a project is distributed over its life cycle. We all tend to focus on the construction, so many millions or even billions of dollars are involved in constructing this project, but in fact up to 70 percent of the total cost of a project over its life cycle is in the operations and maintenance phase. So when we're looking at bringing costs in line with charges, that is the area where we can have the biggest impact and where we should be focusing on. Um, and as well as the operations and maintenance, there's a rehab and repair to extend the life of the project during that part of the pie. So to enable us to get that fiscal balance back in place, we need to focus on building uh, features into projects, into infrastructure during the design and construction phases, which will minimize the costs over the operations and maintenance. Now, that can be new technologies. It can also be intelligent, making the, the infrastructure intelligent systems. For example, by providing real-time feedback on their performance, okay, and that will have a most significant effect if we focus on that particular aspect. So, I'm now going to get to the, uh, the I suppose, my um, passion in this. And we're not currently in a sustainable situation. I think that's clear whether we're in the US, Canada, or various parts around the world. How do we move towards that sustainable state? There is a growing awareness, awareness that we do have an infrastructure deficit. 
number of different studies have come up with various numbers, okay, varying from billions to trillions in the US. We need to communicate openly about the need to address that infrastructure and also the consequences if we do not address it. The fact that the services, our infrastructure delivers to us and in fact our quality of life and economic competitiveness will decrease. We need to be honest about that as well if we do not do anything and then implement the initiatives required. Uh, for example, the Ontario government has recognized that this is a very important priority and has uh, recently implemented a municipal infrastructure strategy to help municipalities in the asset management in managing their assets in the most efficient way. Um, I will now shamelessly <laughs> promote OCSI, an organization which I am in fact the chair, there's a conflict of interest uh, declaration, and uh, which I feel can act as a model going forward in addressing this issue. As uh, Senator Egerton uh, mentioned, uh, this is an umbrella group for six professional organizations in the infrastructure field. Uh, our mission is promoting safe and sustainable infrastructure. We've had some, I think, significant successes and impact. Uh, we were worked closely with the Ministry of Infrastructure uh, during the development of their municipal infrastructure strategy, and we look to continue that relationship. So, summarizing my message, uh, we do have a challenge that we, as a society, as professionals, etc., uh, need to address and innovation should be a key part of coming up with the solutions and address that problem. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments and questions going forward. Thank you very much, Carl. That's an interesting statistic. 70% uh, is, is O&M of the costs. Chris Kennedy is our next speaker. He's Associate Professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Toronto. He teaches courses in infrastructure, economics, engineering, ecology, and the design of infrastructure for sustainable cities. His work involves applying principles of industrial ecology to the design of urban infrastructure, including buildings, water systems, and urban uh, transportation. Uh, it, he has written uh, books and uh, uh, his one book, The Evolution of Great World Cities, Urban Wealth and Economic Growth, was published uh, in 2011 by the University of Toronto Press. Chris Kennedy. Thank you very much, Senator, for introducing me. It's very kind of you. And, and thanks, everyone, for, for sticking through this session. Uh, we're running a little late here. But uh, I've spent about 10, 15 years working on sustainable cities and infrastructure for sustainable cities. And I, I guess the key questions today are, you know, what does the intelligent city need to know and what kind of infrastructure does the intelligent city need to build? I'm going to narrow that down a little bit by really just focusing on climate change. It, it's the, the greatest overarching challenge that our society faces globally just now, both from a resilience perspective and a, and a, and a mitigation perspective. But I'm going to start at the global scale. I, I was very fortunate. Uh, last year to go away for a whole year, take my family to Paris and uh, spend a year working with the OECD and, and, and have access to an incredible amount of data both from the IEA and the OECD on, uh, on global infrastructure systems and, and, and climate change. And I, I was part of a team that was working on the question of well, how do you mobilize the private sector to spend billions on low carbon climate resilient infrastructure. And as part of that effort of being sort of the engineer on the team, I came up with this, this diagram, and it's going to blow up and get very confusing, so you have to pay attention to it. So it basically, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a, a plan, a global infrastructure plan to save the world. That's, that's kind of how ambitious it is. Uh, basically, if you have policies that, that lower the carbon associated with buildings and transportation systems, I mean, substantially lower the carbon, really energy efficient, really low carbon, you, uh, you then decrease your need to, to burn oil and natural gas, and, uh, which makes sense, right? You don't need to burn these things anymore because you've got low energy. That actually means that you no longer need to build oil and natural gas infrastructure, like none of these keystone pipelines, none of that kind of stuff, right? Forget that. That's 20th century engineering. Uh, there's an economic argument there that you then actually free up capital, and if that capital is invested into uh, green power generation, green electricity, that electricity then actually helps support the greening of the buildings and the vehicles. You know, if you have an electric car that's running off coal-powered electricity, it's not a green car. That, uh, that uh, cycle is the, the key heart of uh, a system of global infrastructure, which uh, begins to impact other infrastructure sectors. 
What happens when you uh, recognize that you, you no longer need to burn coal to generate electricity and you no longer need to burn oil and gas to heat buildings is you, you've actually reduced global trade by tonnage by 45%. You no longer need to move 45% of global trade. You still have more value, but you actually free up rail and, and uh, port capacity. You also will free up 45% of your uh, rail capacity on the US railway as well. And that leads to some cost savings, which begin to play out into other sectors. You convert, you, you move freight from uh, road to rail. You use your excess port capacity to grow trade in components of low carbon buildings, uh, vehicles, and supply, energy supply systems. It gets a bit of a messy diagram, but there's actually some economic numbers behind this. There's a bit, there's some gaps in them, but there's there's some there's some possible reality to this global system. So the intelligent city is a city that kind of gets what a low carbon economy looks like and begins to get participate in it. We're actually not doing bad in this part of the world. Now, let's move more about the focus down of the cities here. Here's a, a graph showing, uh, Dan's going to show this as well actually later, but his is going to go further than mine. I'm, I'm just going up to 2010. This is showing urban population in uh, catching up global rural population as about 2006. And I'm now going to add a second y-axis to this graph, which is going to be global energy use. Watch how closely global energy use falls with global urban population. Right? People band around numbers like, oh, cities are responsible for 80% of global climate emissions, or 70%, or 90%. Well, it's probably about 100%. It's probably 100%, whether it's due to the energy use in the cities or the, the wealth effect, the wealth of cities and the, dry, the things that they pull in. Basically, global energy use fits the glove with global population. The, it, cities are the, the main focus, the main driver of, of the whole climate change issue, the whole, the whole challenge, and the solution too. Now, I, over the last 10 years or so, I've been doing lots of studies of cities around the world, and with Dan and others have been helping me collect some of the data. Uh, I'm not going to go into the full details of this slide, but what this slide shows you, though, is that different cities are going to have to use very different strategies. Some cities have very high carbon intensity of the electricity grids. They're not great places for electric vehicles or for solutions that involve using electricity. Some cities are, are, are too dense. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, some cities are dense and can use strategies such as uh, uh, public transit, uh, or they can use things like district energy systems. Others are, are, are sprawled too much so that, and this is Greater Toronto if you're wondering about Toronto in this diagram, not the city of Toronto. Uh, they're, they're sprawled so much that, that some strategies are really not going to work or they're going to take decades and decades before they would play out. So there's, there's a number, the message here is that different cities will use different strategies and cities need to know where they are on this map and, and similar other strategy maps that we've developed for, for cities. The other piece of the climate change challenge that cities need to be aware of is it's not just about mitigation, it's also adaptation to climate change. And here if you begin to look at different strategies that cities and infrastructure strategies that cities can use, you see that some strategies work for mitigation but don't necessarily work for adaptation. So for example, small hydropower is great for mitigation because it's a, a low carbon source of electricity, but if that hydropower is competing for other scarce water resources, it, it may not be such a good thing for adaptation to climate change. Similarly, a uh, converse example is using an air conditioner is great for adapting to really uh, stressful, high, uh, hot days, extreme uh, temperatures, but uh, if it's running off conventional fossil fuels, it's not very good for mitigation. Similarly, with desalination of water. The good news is that most uh, infrastructure strategies actually fall in that sweet spot, which are good for mitigating climate change and adapting to climate change. And so this is, again, the sort of uh, lens that cities need to look through as they develop intelligent strategies for both mitigating and adapting uh, climate change. Just a couple of slides to end with, because there was in preparing for this panel, there was some discussion about the infrastructure deficit, the fact that we've got many, many infrastructure systems uh, falling to pieces. Here's a picture of the Gardner Expressway. Not, but it could be, right, if we leave it long enough, right? <laughs> but, uh, crumbling roads and bridges. And it, it reminded me, well, what, what was the solution to these problems? And it, it took me back to Schumpeter, the uh, Austrian Harvard economist who talks about uh, revolutions. And his answer would be something like this. It would be, great. The infrastructure of the carbon economy is crumbling. Good. We need some creative destruction. Thank you. Who's that on the horse?
I was wondering who that was on the horse. It's not Rob Ford, though. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Uh, Daniel uh, Hornwig uh, is our final panelist. Uh, he is a professor uh, and Jeff Boyce Research Chair at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. He's also an advisor and fellow of, on, in the Sustainable Development Network for the World Bank. Um, he was, in fact, a lead urban specialist at the bank's Central Urban Advisory Unit prior to moving back uh, here to Ontario uh, last year. While he was at the World Bank uh, for almost 20 years, Dan worked with more than 400 cities in all of the bank's six geographic uh, regions. He managed teams overseeing more than $3 billion in investment in some 100 projects in a diverse range of countries, including Indonesia, China, India, and those in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Central America. Dan was lead author on Canada's first municipal green plan and started the first local government roundtable and sustainable development for the city of Guelph. Dan's research at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology focuses on energy systems, the role of natural gas as a transportation fuel, and sustainable cities, especially the greater Toronto area and its place in the world. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Senator Ed Eggleton. Um, I'd like to pick up on that last point. Um, very quick overview, Canada, Toronto, our place in the world, and with a specific focus on, well, I guess, I'm thinking grandkids these days, which is a really scary potential, um, but where we're going to be maybe in 2050. We've heard a lot about where cities are um, coming from. This is the, the magic slide that everybody looks at. Around 2006, 2007, maybe 2008, we hit that magic inflection point. Half of the world now lives, it's over half now, lives in cities. Canada hit that point in 1921, and that's really important. We had a lot of young men who went off to war, and many didn't come back. We became the first big, biggish country that hit that 50% urban level, and that drove our economy. Uh, our keynote speech that we heard uh, just earlier, I would argue that abundance, yes, it's, it's a synonym for urbanization. Urban Cities are driving our abundance, whether it's our affluence or our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is, we heard earlier, about 3 million residents each week moving to cities. I've been working now in China for maybe about 20 years. This is Shenzhen. It really was that small 30 years ago, and today it's over 10 million people. Cities are growing like weeds around the world. Um, and we need, as, as Ontarians, as the GTA, need to figure out what does that mean for us? What does it mean for our kids? Um, this is, anybody know where this is? It's not a coincidence that the Pope is from Buenos Aires. The, it's like the Wayne Gretzky approach to geopolitical power. The puck is moving to the developing world. This is Brazil, or sorry, this is Argentina, where the Pope is from. You're going to see things shifting to South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, and then finally Africa. Africa will be the last region that urbanizes, and it will be the biggest and the most important. And how goes Africa goes the rest of the world. Um, growing urban challenges, we've heard of, about many of these. I would just simply say that almost all of the big problems we face today, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, economic problems, deficits, whatever you want to look at that's really big and complex is being driven by urbanization. Um, here, this is a whole bunch of smart scientists got together and said, well, what are the big problems? Chris mentioned um, climate change. Climate change is the most intractable problem that we're facing today. Um, but it's certainly not on its own. You can see this is biodiversity, nitrogen. It's just a symptom of a planet that's out of whack, and it's out of whack because of urbanization. But that's also the good news because it's urbanization that's driving the wealth that's going to get us out of this problem. So this is, don't worry about that you can't see this, but this is the world's 100 largest cities. And for me, this slide is the be afraid, be very afraid slide. You'll see that there's not any city in the bottom right-hand quadrant. That is the only quadrant, or I guess six, whatever, uh, whatever six is of, uh, anyways, that bottom right-hand part. Um, there's no cities there. That is the only place that's sustainable. Over 550, that red line, that's where Toronto is. You can see it's way in the top right there. That is 
easily three degrees global warming, probably closer to four degrees global warming. I work at the World Bank, we're, we're used to, an incredibly conservative organization. We got a new president, and the first thing he did was agreed to issue this report last year on four degrees. The World Bank is on record for this, which is be afraid, be very afraid, because we're headed to a four degree world. Um, and it looks like it's not stoppable. We're going to be getting into um, probably geoengineering. And this, I think, is, this is, the data is old, but I think it's important that we in Canada get an appreciation of what this says. Basically, on the right, that's us and the US. That's per capita greenhouse gas emissions. And then way over on the right are countries like Bangladesh, Tanzania, et cetera. Climate change, the reason Chris mentioned this, I think partly why it's such a big challenge is that it is the world's biggest market failure. Those who are causing the problem are not the ones who are going to be impacted the most. So those people on the right are going to get angrier and angrier and angrier as problems hit their countries, flooding in Bangladesh, and they will say, they will start pointing fingers and the fingers will point north. Um, the inequity in the world is also um, within a city. This is some of the best data that we have. Uh, fortunately, this is, this is Chris's data. <laughs> and it shows three neighborhoods in the GTA. An order of magnitude difference in household greenhouse gas emissions in the same city. So what you do is important, but where you live is more important. And this gives us hope that there are things that we know we can do even here in Toronto to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so apologies to people from Whitby, but it is an important point. There are things that can be done, and basically density and, and taking TTC in smaller houses get you an enormous reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So simply put, the problems of climate change, the war to, to address climate change, will be won or lost in cities. Um, and we definitely need a new urban agenda in our cities. And this, that was Rio de Janeiro, who arguably is leading, I think. Um, we kind of have a three-trick pony when it comes to urban, urban problem solving. One is density. Density makes a big difference. Even though human nature, we love to have more space and to spread all over the place, it comes with a big cost. Public policy makes a big difference. And as Patricia was mentioning, the third, I think, is metrics. You know, this is, uh, in God we trust, everybody else bring me data. You cannot manage a city well if you do not have good data. Um, so what does this that. mean for Canada? Um, <laughs> I think it means two, well, it means many things, but two things that I would just like to throw out very quickly is that we need to make the greater Toronto area, whatever you want to call it, GTHA, Metro Toronto, et cetera, the best managed, the best governed, yes, it's possible, the best, the most efficient city in the world because that will create more markets for our businesses than any other thing in the world. Um, and we need to convince the rest of Canada that as goes Toronto, goes the rest of Canada. We are not a resource economy anymore. We are an innovation economy, and it is cities. The bigger the city, the more innovation it drives. Um, and we have good starting point. The places to grow legislation in Toronto, the GTA, is among the best in the world. But the devil's always in the detail. Um, and then uh, simply how we do this, I think, is that we have to kind of keep this 2050 in mind. And it helps to overcome, I think, a lot of these, who's gonna pay for transit and these sorts of things. We can tie ourselves up in amazing knots as a city. But if we say, 2050, what does it mean for my grandkids? A lot of those problems become solvable much faster. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dan. You've given us a great international perspective and some good stuff to talk about uh, Toronto and uh, Ontario as well. Which neighborhood was it, by the way? Oh, it is one. It's not the one where the... York. Oh, really? East York? I, suppose. I thought the Etobicoke one. Uh, the mayor lived in there, doesn't he, somewhere? <laughs> anyway, we now there. come to the Q&A portion. Uh, of, we've got 10 minutes for it. Uh, so please come to the microphones. I'll start off with a question while you're getting to the microphones. Uh, <laughs> And I, I'm going to start with you, Lucy, because uh, uh, Lucy uh, has to leave to catch a flight. Uh, so Lucy, catch you. Uh, I, I want to ask about 
the infrastructure deficit in Ontario. I know I, I keep seeing these reports from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. It talks about $171 billion of late as being the infrastructure deficit for Canada. How large and how pressing do you think uh, it is in Ontario? And in addressing the challenges of it, talk about the opportunity Carl, to replace this aging infrastructure with more sustainable solutions, innovative design, and more intelligent urban form. Because you talked about that in your presentation. So if you could just give us a little bit on that, and if anybody else wants to jump in, please do. Lucy. Sure. Well, I think that uh, we are really facing a, a large challenge, but it's not a challenge without solutions. So the P3 model has been used globally to help fund and get a kickstart on some of the infrastructure renewal that is needed. And it's an innovative uh, methodology to allow cities and, and provinces to push forward in terms of infrastructure planning. But as Carl mentioned, it's, it doesn't stop just at the, the funding of the capital investment. You also have to ensure that you have a, a sustainable way to maintain the facilities. And there are solutions that we have seen around the world. And different models exist uh, for transit. There are new models that are coming forward all the time. Um, and also for buildings, the build outs and so forth, if you apply sustainable technologies, you can actually get the funding from the energy savings. And this is a really key factor. Uh, we ha actually have done that uh, for the city of Timmins, where they had 59 aging buildings and the city said, we just can't cope with the rising cost of maintaining these buildings. So we, we at Siemens did a solution for them where they could retrofit those buildings and pay for all of those retro, retrofits through the energy savings. So they didn't have to affect their balance sheet and they didn't have to go and raise taxes. You mentioned P3s. Let me flip over to Carl and see if you want to add something about P3s, the challenge that that faces for the yeah. municipal sector particularly. I, I think there's also ch opportunities as well with P3s, uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, P3s do allow uh, municipalities and government bodies to tap into the financial resources and also the, the private sector discipline that comes along with the private companies. Um, they, at the present time, they have been largely carried out for larger projects, particularly on the health, uh, health sector, um, in the health sector, and also on the transportation sector. Um, there's two challenges in moving towards other sectors uh, for municipalities. One is size. There are is a lot of what's termed deal costs. The costs involved in the lawyers, the finances, et cetera, et cetera, in setting up P3s, which tend to limit them to projects in $50 million and above. Okay? Um, so there's talk about bringing in a portfolio approach to projects. And the second one, to be frank, is public perception. Um, there is a lot of, I'm, I'm very familiar with the water and wastewater sector, and there has been a lot of pushback um, to, for P freeze in the water sector. Uh, the city of Abbotsford, for example, uh, just had one uh, rejected uh, due to the concern uh, from the, or, or the perception from the public and the, uh, the, um, the union sector that we are selling a public resource, water, to the private sector. That is not, in fact, the case. The water and the assets themselves, the, the, the systems themselves, would rely, remain in the public hand. Okay? What you're doing is you're outsourcing the operations okay, and the construction of those assets and systems to the private sector. So there's both challenges and opportunities. Okay? And I don't think really in the municipal sector yet we've decided where we are in that space. Okay, anybody else want to pick up the opportunities in Ontario and the, the P3 possibilities? Anybody else? Oh, Chris? yeah, I'll, I'll add something on the P3s. I, as part of my work with the OECD last year, I had to sort of wrestle somewhat with the role of the P3s in, in, in funding global infrastructure systems. And they're very challenging. I mean, I, you know, when you think about having some construction done on your house, you know, when something goes wrong and you think, oh, I've got to get something fixed, and you own a home stars and you look for three or four contractors, and it's, it's, a, it's a really challenging process to have a small piece of construction done in your house. Now, blow that up to a, a large scale piece of infrastructure. The risks and the uncertainties involved in infrastructure are really large. And so, 
if you look back over the last 100 years or so, typically pure public projects typically have overruns of, on average, of something like 20%. As high as 40%, and sometimes they come in under, right? But there's a, there's a typical t tendency for public projects to run over. So then the P3 comes along, you bring in the skills of the private sector, uh, and you, you bring in the ability to share the risks appropriately, and that P3s can, can work. But there are more, you're adding an extra layer of complexity, so you really need very uh, very well established uh, bodies for dealing and managing with P3s. You need a lot of experience. We looked at developing world uh, countries, uh, in particular China, but, but others too, and they've, over the last 20 years, they've just basically been learning how to do P3s in their own kind of way, and it, it's something that countries learn to do. Uh, we're actually doing fairly well in, in Canada generally. We've got some good experience in P3s, so I think it's something that we could build upon and, and go forward with, but, but with the right reservations about the public perception about it, uh, it's something that we could do well. Okay, I've got to go to the floor. Lucy, okay. thank you. If you thank have to go, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, to the floor, uh, I noticed the gentleman at microphone one had got up first, so I'll go microphone one and then two. Uh, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the discussion and uh, uh, your observations. And I guess the question I have is around sustainability, and uh, you, you reflect on the growth and the, uh, you know, the growth of population, urbanization, and the climate change issue. So when, or are you having discussions about moving to more of a steady state economy? And uh, the, the material that's coming out of the New Economics Foundation in England, that at some point for sustainability, the economy has to, we are in a limited planet. It cannot grow forever. And so the techno fix plan A and plan B are not necessarily the, uh, uh, the survival the sustainability options. So I wonder if you could comment about a move to steady state economics if you believe it or see it as an option. Okay, who wants to pick up on that? Uh, Dan, do you want to start? I'll, I'll yeah. give it a try. Um, agree, complete. I think the, to a large extent, since the Industrial Revolution, what's been driving our economy is urbanization, sort of. And when we're going to hit a steady state, is once we have basically the, the world urbanized, as urbanized as it's going to be. And the question really is, the $64 trillion question is, are we going to get there before we completely screw up the planet? Um, and the hope is yes, and I'm optimistic, but it's not going to be easy. I think we're going to get into geoengineering, we're going to have to figure out how to start sharing a lot better, um, but Yes, I mean the steady state economy, uh, you can already see it starting to appear in places like um, Japan, where they're start, you can actually see how they've, they've hit a population peak and they're, they're starting to gradually come down and they're figuring out how many, what is our rate of immigration, these sorts of things. Um, and the last big part of the planet to urbanize and to, and to get us to this steady state economy will be Africa. And we did a, a paper looking at peak waste to try, which is a surrogate of sort of global environmental impact, thinking it would be somewhere around 2060, 26, 70 maybe, but we don't see it happening before 2100. Um, but say just shortly after the turn of the century, we will be as close as we're going to get to a steady state economy. What the final population will be, we don't know, but we do know that the generally the smaller it is by 2100, the better all of our grandkids or great grandkids by then, I suppose, will be. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're really running out of time, so I'm going to ask uh, just uh, microphone number two to ask a question, and we'll get a quick answer, and then we'll yeah, wrap it up. A, it's a very quick question to Patricia, and it's about access to this data that GCIF is gathering. So there are many researchers across Canada and internationally who'd love to be able to very quickly access that data to do their own models and forecasting. So. Do you want to talk about the availability of that data and the real-time or other access to it? Patricia. Thank you for the question. Um, we've been working with our cities now for the last couple of years as they've been reporting into the database to begin to have trust enough to open it up to the public. So what we've been doing is phasing it over time. At this point, um, we've now opened up all the profile data that they report to us. And we're hoping that the next uh, phase will be some of our performance management data. 
Um, cities join the GCIF and self-report, so the city is owned by uh, the, the cities own the data as they report it into the GCIF, and we have a membership um, with a protected password so that the cities feel comfortable reporting it in these first few years. What we're finding is that as cities uh, get a little bit more comfortable with reporting into a global website like this, that they're starting to consent to more and more release. So we're taking it in small doses, but now all the profile indicator, if you look at the website, is all public, and we're hoping the performance management will be phased over the next few years. By the way, if any, if I can get a commercial in here, if any uh, corporations out there are interested in becoming involved, as uh, Patricia noted in her slide presentation, and we do have a number of companies who are already uh, part of our advisory group, and we're happy to welcome more aboard. Uh, so that wraps it up. We've got a get out of here because there's another session coming in. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you to the panelists, and I'll turn it back to uh, Belinda. Well, thank you, Art. And uh, again, we've had some excellent insights from all our panelists this afternoon about uh, the keys to driving the creation of smarter, healthier cities. So please stay engaged. I'd like to thank our panelists again, Patricia McCarney, Lucy Kasacha, Carl Bodimead, Chris Kennedy, and Dan Horwig, and especially to our moderator, Art Eggleton, for keeping our session on track. Thank you all very much for generously taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in the panel today. Uh, I'd like to offer each of you a small token of our appreciation for taking part. And I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for your participation, and I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. If you would like to remain in this theater, the next panel session, which is starting very shortly, is reframing the water energy picture. Thank you again, and enjoy the rest of Discovery.